This is the podcast Person of Interest, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. This week, Mike Collier talks to historian professor John Horn about Irish and Baltic history. Well, welcome once again to the Stockholm School of Economics in the centre of Riga here, where we'll be uh, recording another podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome another eminent uh, academic to SSE today, Professor John Horn, for, who is a fellow emeritus of history at Trinity College Dublin. Welcome, <laughs> Professor Horn. Thank you, Mike, and delighted to be here at the SSE and indeed in Riga. It's my first time, so I have everything to learn. <laughs> if you could just start off by giving us a little bit of uh, background about yourself. I mean, I noticed that you've actually been at Trinity since 1977. I spent my whole career in Trinity, yes, yes. But, but um, you may not pick it up immediately from the accent, but I'm actually half Australian, half English. Grew up um, for most of my childhood and adolescence in Australia became fascinated by France, so it seemed ultimately entirely logical that a, an Anglo-Australian should live in Dublin and work on, work on French history. Um, what was it that took you to... The labour market. To the, yeah. uh, there was a job in Trinity College Dublin in, in French history. I was still writing my PhD, and I, was, I thought, I'll have a weekend in Dublin, I won't get the job, that will be wonderful. Um, but I was lucky enough to get the job, and it turned out to be a wonderful institution for, for me to be in, partly because, um, as you know, it's Ireland's oldest university. It has a wonderful library, um, and uh, as a centre of scholarship, it was, um, it was a great place to be. But also because the Ireland that I got to know in the late 1970s and the 1980s was still a rather inward-turned um, country. Um, people wrote about Irish history. They, that's precisely why they began to want to employ people who worked on European history, like myself. And in the years that I was in Trinity... Ireland itself turned around. Um, it escaped from the shadow of uh, the United Kingdom, uh, despite the troubles in Northern Ireland, which were a very troubling period from 1968-69 to the Belfast Peace Agreement in, in 1998. Ireland found a role for itself in Europe, punched above its weight. And so I established the European Studies degree in Trinity, for example, um, which uh, turned out in the longer term to be a, a, re a real success. Um, students having to do two foreign languages and, and study contemporary uh, continental Europe from the 16th century onwards. So Ireland turned around and looked outwards in that period. So actually, I was very fortunate. Mm. My period in Trinity coincided with the country opening up to Europe. And that, was, and that showed to me that as a historian working on France and Europe, Ireland was a wonderful base from which to do comparative and transnational European history. It must be reasonably, I mean, correct me if, if I'm wrong, mm. it, it must be reasonably unusual to be walking into that situation where you're aware that there is a huge appetite, as you've mm. described it, for a different perspective. Yes. Because, you know, the groves of academe and so on, it can, all, it can often be the case that we've always done it this way, we'll carry on doing it yeah. this way, yeah. tradition against sort of progress. But yes. what you're saying is quite different. <laughs> There was the appetite for, for, for change, slowly, but I gradually realised that was happening, both within the university and also within society at large. Irish people were just getting interested in Europe, going to Europe. Ireland was playing a role in Europe, and there was a, a growing self-confidence in the, in, in the country, which in part was, um, was due to that. And it's also partly due to the particular institution, Trinity College, which is wonderfully... It has an old... It, it perhaps did more than it does now, but even now, there's a kind of... Um, relaxed um, trust in the individual and basically if I, what I was free to in terms of my research get on with whatever I, whatever I wanted to do so creating a kind of centre of interest in French and continental European history was uh, if I wanted to do that that was absolutely fine and, uh, and, and, and so as I say it became an exciting base from, yeah, from, yeah, from which to do that. And what was the initial uh, trigger or the initial interest that put you in the direction of French and continental history? I mean, was there a teacher, an incident, uh, a book you read that inspired you? I was... Th the first thing I can think of is that in 1962, um, I was just 13, and we were coming back from Australia to England to, to spend a, a, a nine months in England, um, and the ship stopped in Marseille. Hmm. And the Mistral was blowing, and we couldn't get out of port for three days. This was early February 1962. So we had three days stuck in Marseille. And to me, it was, it was an eye-opener. I mean, I loved the sound of the language. There was this city. But the thing which struck me above all was this was in the, the final throes of the Algerian War. This was a city at war. Hmm. 
you could cut the atmosphere with ice. There were um, uh, foreign legionary, foreign legion soldiers everywhere. There were men in jeeps driving too fast. You could sense the, uh, the, the tension in the atmosphere. And that sensitized me to war as well as to, uh, to France. And then subsequently, I went back to Australia where my school French was taught not, not very well. And I remember my final year in school, this exotic creature landed in our class. Lord knows why the school had employed him. Thank goodness they did, called Monsieur Mounier. Monsieur Mounier was very slim. He, had, he wore perfume, and Australian men did not wear perfume <laughs> in those days. He had these wonderful, immaculate Paris, Parisian coutured suits, suede shoes to die for. We hadn't seen the likes <laughs> of them before. And when he started reciting French poetry, he, I remember he opened a book, first class, and started reciting Apollinaire's poetry, mm -hmm. Sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Seine. And I was, I, was, I was hooked. On closer inspection, it turned out that Monsieur Meunier was in fact a pied noir from Algeria. He was a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. And there was no place for him in the France of the early mid-1960s. So he'd set off with his wife to travel around the world and ended up in our school. So from little accidents like that, I just was hooked on the notion of French history, but also deeply interested in war. And the background was the Vietnam War in Australia. And Australia was much more closely involved mm -hmm. in, I and mean, it, was, it was involved in the Vietnam War. So that touched me very closely. And so those were the things which brought me to France, but also to what turned into a kind of a career-long interest in the history of war. And uh, speaking of war, you're going yes. to be at the Latvian <clears throat> War Museum in a, a few hours' yes, time. You've indeed. very kindly taken a little bit of time to uh, visit us first here at SSE. Uh, for a conference which is titled Struggles for Latvia's Independence and Recognition Across European Perspectives. Mm. Maybe not the catchiest uh, title ever, but what will you be speaking of there? I'm not an expert on Latvian history. There will be plenty of experts on Latvian history at the conference, and I'm really looking forward to, to learning more about Latvia during this period. But I have for a long time been a historian of the Great War um, uh, in, in a transnational sort of sense. Now, you might ask me, what, what do I mean by transnational? Initially, I suppose, um, I was a comparative historian. Always being an outsider in whatever country I, I had been in, uh, comparative history seemed to me a way to make sense of this. And my first book, my PhD, was a comparative study of the French and the British labor movements. But from comparative history, I began to see the virtues of what I would call transnational history. And what I mean by that is, and I do mean something quite specific by it, because sometimes it can be used as a general sort of catch-all writing world history or global history. What I mean is that there are certain dynamics, certain things which drive history, which by their very nature um, are, transcend one particular country. Let me give you an example from the First World War. The military history of the First World War, even today, is by and large written in a national framework. Studies of the British Army, the French Army, the German Army, the Russian Army. War is deeply interactive. Mm. And the thing which drove the First World War, in fact, was a combination of industrialized warfare, which had never been seen before, high explosive shells, mechanized firepower, machine guns, and a siege, siege warfare, because men had to go to ground to survive. Each side was doing it. Each side was doing it mutually, and they were doing it around Europe. So to understand the war in Europe, you have to understand coalition warfare, and you, had to un and you have to understand a type of warfare that was common to both camps and see what they made of it and what they learned from each other in doing it. That's an example of what I mean by transnational um, uh, uh, history. And I suppose the, the argument is that if you just look at it from a national point of view, you're almost doomed to misunderstand it. And that led me at, at uh, 20 years ago in the sort of, um, in, my, in my years at Trinity with a very close friend and colleague there who's a specialist in German history, we decided to look at a question which was a very controversial one and which we felt had never been solved. And that was the, the so-called German atrocities of 1914. What happened when the Germans invaded France and Belgium mm -hmm. in 1914? And they committed a series of crimes against, uh, war crimes against innocent civilians, which had long been dismissed as allied invention, allied propaganda. And without going into the details, we spent 10 years researching that together. I, it took so long that I even devised a new unit of account, which is a historian year. So for the two of us, it meant it was a book which took 20 historian years <laughs> to produce. But the, the upshot of it was to suggest that if you looked at it only from the Belgian or the British or the German point of view, by definition, you were doomed to misunderstand what had occurred. Whereas what occurred was really transnational. The core of the phenomenon was that the German army invading Belgium and France in, in August, September 1914 believed 
wrongly, but believed they were faced with a mass civilian uprising. And that mass civilian uprising, by which their imagination was haunted, led them to take um, a, a, a very drastic um, a, 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 a actions against the civilians, which then became sort of preemptive in order mm. not to face more of what they wrongly imagined they were facing. They began to take out whole villages and execute so they people. they got their retaliation in first. In first, that's mm. right. And then the whole thing became deeply controversial, and the, uh, the disagreements on both sides became one of the major propaganda themes during the war, and it was something that was never resolved post-19... 18. So that was a, a, it was a terrific project to be able to do that, to, apart from anything else, to demonstrate that only a, a transnational history could really kind of actually show what had happened, but why <clears throat> each side um, remained completely divided as to what had happened. Looking back on it, I realized when the book came out, the research was done in the 1990s, and the book came out in 2001, and then was translated into French and German. But I realized, looking back at it now, that it was, it was very much a product of the 1990s, which really was a European decade. I think we're only just mm. beginning to see that now, in terms of the upsurge of populisms and divisive nationalism in Europe, that the, that the 1990s, in some ways, was a kind of golden decade for the European idea, and it allowed intellectually, um, and not just in history, I think, in other disciplines too, but it, it, it allowed projects to be done on a European and a transnational scale, which in some ways are more difficult today. So that was a long answer to your <laughs> question, but at the conference this afternoon, I will be uh, 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 putting forward an argument, which is that uh, the Great War um, that we think ended in November 1918 didn't end in November 1918. It's a fetishized date. Uh, but in fact, the war transmuted into further wars, revolutions, counter-revolutions, social violence uh, of various kinds across much of Central and Eastern Europe and indeed in the Middle East and also, I would say, in Ireland. It wasn't entirely confined to the East. And that cycle of violence didn't really come to an end until about 1923. Even in 1923, if you look across the press in Europe, there's still the sense that the continent is at war. 1924, it's changed. It, there's the sense that, that, that peace has finally arrived. And so it's an argument about what I would call the greater war. Mm. That's to say that 1914-18 is the brutal epicenter of a kind of cycle of violence which opens in 1911-1912. The Italians invade the Ottoman Empire in North Africa, and then you have the Balkan Wars but which continues um, uh, through until, in, until 1923. And, of course, the Baltic states and Latvian independence have their own national history of all of that, but it seems to me that they're very much part of this broader phenomenon that I would call the Greater War. Well, there absolutely does seem to be. And, in fact, currently there's quite a concerted effort as we're at the centenary of, mm. well, just after the end yes. of the, the fetishized 1918 yes, yes. date, uh, there's quite a concerted drive in Latvia, it seems to me, to communicate the fact that right. for the Baltic states, it didn't end there yeah. and it carried on into 1919, 1920. Well, that's right. And I, and, and I see, I think that's really welcome. And I see excellent evidence of that in the, um, the exhibition, uh, a series of very interesting panels, which, is, which will be opening at the, at the Museum of War. Um, uh, uh, in the context of this conference, which is on that, the struggle for Latvian independence and recognition in this broader context. And so probably the majority of the panels which are in that exhibition come from an exhibition which was held in Paris in the autumn of last year called Aleste la guerre sans fin, um, in the East, the war without end, 1918-1923. And and I think that's perhaps one of the reasons that I'm here. I was privileged to be the, um, uh, the scientific director of that, um, chairing the scientific committee of that um, exhibition uh, with the, the Musée de l'Armée, the Army Museum in Paris. And it was a, a perfect demonstration of what we're talking about. And you might have thought, you know, that the, if you didn't know them, that the Army Museum in Paris would do a very conservative exhibition on the great victory of 1918, how the French army won the war. Not a bit of it. They were absolutely delighted with the idea, which I talked over with um, the then director of their temporary exhibitions, the idea of doing an exhibition which said exactly the opposite, that the war didn't end mm. on November the 11th, 1918, but it continued in the, particularly in the East and the Middle East, and indeed that the French and the British were involved in, at, at two levels. They were involved as the peacemakers at the Paris Peace Conference, but they were involved on the ground, their, their army and their navy, both as observers and as participants in various theatres, of course, including in the, in, in the Baltic states. And so it was an exhibition which was enormous fun and a great privilege to be able to work on in Paris. 
And the museum director told me subsequently that it was a, a huge success. They had something like something in the order of 55,000 visitors in the space of four months. Um, and I was uh, amazed and delighted when I received the proofs of the catalogue to see that President Macron had prefaced the catalogue. And in fact, he used some of the themes of the exhibition in his major speech at the Arc de Triomphe on the 11th of November um, last year. So panels from that exhibition have come here, and as I understand it, the Museum of War in Riga and the Latvian uh, National Library and other institutions, the Institut Francais, have participated and put together uh, this little exhibition on uh, Latvia and the Greater War, in effect. Well, from what you say, that suggests uh, what is one of the perennial questions that historians are always asked, which is, you know, why should we study history? What effect does it have on the yeah. current day? You've sort of answered that in, in that from what you're saying, this century old history, the, re, the, the way in which it's reappraised in these transnational yeah. terms is feeding into modern political and social understanding in, in Europe. Absolutely, and I, I think there are, I can give two examples of the way in which I think that um, happens in this, in this um, particular case. Um, the, the first is that I think one of the reasons that there was such strong public interest in the exhibition in Paris was its kind of intellectual claims seemed to make sense. That's to say, if you, if you want to understand a very basic but fundamental um, thing, which is why after a First World War, there's a Second World War 20 years later, then the argument of the Greater War gives you some of the keys to understanding that. Because what it tells you at root is that the First World War was like this kind of cataclysm which unleashed far more than it was capable of resolving and attempts to resolve those forces structured the Greater War down to 1923. There's a provisional kind of peace which, which arrives at that point. And I don't mean that it was foredoomed, um, that things could only go one way. We have the impact subsequently of the, um, of the, the crash of 1929 and the Depression, which coming on top of the longer-term effects of the war create many of the circumstances for the Second World War. But it's as if that, that Greater War down to 1923, in a metaphor which I've, I've, I've used, uh, used on occasions, they were like a series of floating historical minds which were kind of bobbing down the currents of history and depending on what happened subsequently, they could explode. Mm. And I think that's what does happen at the end of the 1930s. So given the degree to which the Second World War still shapes the world that we live in, and Lord knows that's true of Latvia as, as, as much or almost more than it is of anywhere else, then understanding the relationship between the Greater War down to 1923 and the Second World War is an absolutely crucial one. But there are also the other, the suggestive parallels which history always has. I mean, it is true that history never repeats itself, but on the other hand, um, it provides all kinds of parallels. Um, and I remember President Macron uh, came to, to, to visit the museum which I'm involved in in France, the Historial de la Grande Guerre at Perron. And there were a group of us historians talking to him afterwards, and he had a very interesting observation. He said that for him, what was so important about the the First World War and historians' work on the First World War and the Greater War and the 1920s was that for him, the 1920s was the decade one had really to understand, to understand Europe now. And he thought that the, the fate of the European project would be decided actually not by Brexit, but in the east of Europe. And so understanding the, the divisions, the nationalism, the gradual emergence of kind of ethnic tensions across the 1920s, the impact which an economic crisis like 1929 uh, can have on social and political developments a number of years later, all of these were ways in which um, studying the interwar period um, was, was deeply informative for understanding the present. Just one of these mines floating down the, the tide of history that, that, that you talked about, what do you think was the psychological impact of the, the Greater War, or the First World War, the Greater War? Because this seems to be something which is, is raised a lot. People talk about a shock of, to civilization and yes. so on. And yet in subsequent histories, it does still tend to be the... I mean, that's kind of the artistic sphere it's, it's yeah. covered. But yeah. it, in, in the historical context, it seems to me, at least as a layman, to be more the economic and military and the yeah. sort of conventional ways of, of explaining things. And as you say, the, the depression and so on. But w was there this psychological hangover which was not addressed and that contributed towards yes. the Second World I th War? I think there was. But I, and I think you're right. You know, the, it's economic, it's military, it's political, it's social, it's also cultural. And as somebody who in the last 20 years has been... 
principally a cultural historian, I'm always interested by the interaction between cultural history and the others. I do not see these as separate, you know, mm. kind of silos. But to answer your question, um, the things which, which, which appear very clearly in the, at the intellectual level, um, I think do have a wider kind of relevance. And, and those things are firstly a sense of disenchantment. The, the ways in which people believed in this war because um, it was an existential war mm. um, for, in, for many of the countries involved, including for, 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 uh, for Britain. And you can't sustain that kind of an effort for, which, by the way, involves the mass mobilization of society in a way that has never occurred before. So the very military model in which you know, all men in most countries are uh, subject to military service, but when they finish their military service, as reservists until the age of 50, they're liable to be recalled at time of war. So if you take the French case, the, the 8 million soldiers are mobilized during the war out of an adult male population of 12 million. Mm. So this is, this is absolutely massive. And my point simply is that you can't sustain that kind of war with those kinds of losses, um, uh, over 10 million military dead, uh, uh, without people believing in it at some level. And however much there's propaganda, unless people actually believe in it, um, uh, it's impossible to do. Afterwards, particularly for the defeated countries, understanding, but even for the victorious countries, understanding how you could possibly have believed that when it didn't produce a new world and when it had had that enormous cost does lead to a kind of disenchantment, which, as I say, one sees particularly clearly in, um, in the case of intellectuals and artists. I mean, if we just think of the great German expressionist artists of the early mm -hmm. 1920s, George Gross and so on, but they have their equivalents um, elsewhere. Um, I think that that is, uh, is, is, is a much wider phenomenon. What I would call a kind of small p pacifism is widespread in the 1920s. People feel this cannot happen again. Ni vie de cri, you know, ne, de, de, ne jamais plus, that we can't do this again. It's something which even the Nazis and the, and the Italian fascists have to take account of. I mean, Hitler's idea of war in the late 1930s is precisely one which will in, av avoid the whole of German society getting bogged down in what it got bogged down in between 1914 and 1918. But if there's a kind of disenchantment to the world, um, there's also a re-enchantment. And that re-enchantment comes in the form of a communism, refusal of imperial war, but not refusal of war, war and revolution of a different kind, which will remake the world anew, but also fascism. Um, and fascism in the form, not just obviously of Italian fascism, those disappointed nationalists who formulate this project for a kind of remilitarization of society on a mass base, which they're doing from, from, from January, February 1919, but the Freikorps, the radical right in Germany, Austria, and elsewhere, and who carry out some of their most violent acts right here in Latvia, in the Baltic states. So you get this radical right, it's the counter-revolution. You get the Bolshevik revolution, which as myth and fantasy sweeps the whole world. For the first time since 1789, a major state incarnates the idea of revolution. Um, and for the counter-revolution, it's seen as the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy and so on. And you get this counter-revolutionary force, which can no longer go back. You, you can't turn the wheel back and go back to an old, old-style pre-1914 conservatism. The demos has been let out of the bag. The, the people is now, in whatever form, the basis of politics. And so you get these new appeals, radical appeals, to left and to right. And uh, in that sense, I think there are these attempts to re-enchant the world. You could even argue that the kind of pacifism that I was talking about it produces also a kind of liberal and pacifist attempt to re-enchant the world. The real believers in the League of Nations, the, the development of international humanitarian intervention, and all of these things aren't the distant byproducts of the First World War. They're produced by the First World War and by the Greater War. I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution is a direct product of the war, but so I would argue, especially through the, uh, the, the, the point about the Greater War, so is fascism and the new radical counter-revolutionary right. There's always a, a certain sort of arrogance of the, of the present when looking for historical lessons and so on, mm. but would it be overstating the case to say that there's a similar, if not quite to the same degree, disenchantment uh, occupying minds at the yep. moment and that we might see some similar or be already seeing some similar attempt to re-enchant in various ways. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think there, there are parallels in that, um, in that way. 
But again, the, 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 the parallels aren't, aren't, aren't exact ones. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had the violence of um, something like the First World War. And by the violence, I mean that propensity, that readiness to to use violence. It, it, it's one of the things that, it's precisely one of the reasons, I think, why the argument about the, the greater war is so important, because that's the moment, uh, in particular, um, in which you see the uh, distinctions between combatants and non-combatants breaking down. Once you've, once you've designated the enemy as a dehumanized Bolshevik um, or as a counter-revolutionary, um, then your readiness to simply destroy them, to destroy men, women, and children, mm. to find the incubus even for genocide is, is, uh, is there. And unfortunately, we haven't had wars of that kind, at least in the West. And so I think that those elements, that, that, that propensity to violence is lacking. But the idea of a reaction, of a populist nationalism, which is seeking some kind of security, some safety in a mythic vision of the past, um, and which is prepared to brutalize its language, its political language, I do see those as um, parallels, and I also see as a parallel the, um, the consequences of the 2008 banking crash and a real crisis mm -hmm. in, the, in the international capitalist system in the same way that happened in, um, in uh, 19, 1929. And I think we are seeing some of the... That, and, there, and it's there that we see some of the parallels with the social movements of the, you know, of the 1930s, the disenchantment, the feeling of people being disinherited, of fearing that their their children will not have the same place in society that they had, and those things are certainly deeply destabilizing. And I think that the liberal order, including in Europe, has perhaps been at fault for not not responding quickly enough to, uh, to, to you know to those things. Yeah, so there are the parallels, um, but history never repeats itself. I think, and perhaps this is the right institution or not <laughs> to say this in, you know, economists and political scientists sometimes think that they, you know, that they have, they can, they can project, they can plan the future and that's what makes them valuable to government. I think one of the, the things that historians come to understand is that um, there's only one lesson you can draw from history and that is nothing ever turns out exactly as planned. When you were speaking earlier, actually mentioning the, the economic uh, aspect of things, it, it did sound a little bit like your transnational uh, way of approaching mm. military history or political history mm. seemed to come from the pre-existing sort of post-Marxist idea of there being transnational capital and transnational economic history. Is there any truth in that? I, it's, 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 an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, I think it probably... I think it probably is the case, um, so because certainly traditionally that's been one of the ways of thinking in, 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 in transnational terms. Um, but in, in terms of history as a discipline, for me one of the um, slightly disappointing things is that economic history has taken a back seat over the last um, 10 to 15 years. Um, and uh, certainly in the fields in which in which I work, where, where it's, it's been more cultural and social history, which have been to the um, uh, to the fore. But I agree with you absolutely that I think that uh, uh, thinking in cultural terms about economic history and indeed about um, demographic history, um, you know, has a lot to offer us. Um, uh, so that the the ways in which e economic processes can be uh, both hijacked but also can be invested with with, with myths uh, with false beliefs um, which have real purchase um, is, uh, is, is, is 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 very important yeah and uh, I mean I've already taken up plenty of your time for which I make no apology whatsoever because it's uh, very interesting to hear you speak but I think it would be remiss of me not to um, cover one extra topic while we're here as a uh, uh, an historian from an Irish, mm -hmm. eminent Irish uh, university, speaking about the Greater War and how mm -hmm. it sort of leaked on for years afterwards. Um, there seem to be some interesting parallels between the Irish experience of winning independence and the experience of, of all three Baltic states, in fact, yeah. but perhaps Latvia in particular. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to outline maybe the more obvious ones about uh, breaking free from a centuries-old dominant uh, yeah. uh, power and, and, and the various rediscoveries of language and, and cultural yeah. expression and so yeah. on. But I was just wondering if you could talk for a little while about what some of those parallels might be, because I guess that Latvians are very keen to say, look, we have this whole extra bit of history which no one really knows about. Mm. But at the same time, I think probably people in this part of the world are fairly 
um, unenlightened as to what Irish history at that period yeah. was as well, and maybe make an assumption that Ireland was already a free, yeah, yeah, independent yeah. country. Yeah. Well, it, it's a great question, and, and of course the, 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 the parallel to what you've just described would be, I think, the tendency in Irish history to explain it in purely Irish terms, to see this as a, as a national history or most a history in terms of Anglo-Irish um, relations. And one of the things that I and some other historians have been trying to do over the last um, uh, uh, 10 to 15 years is to say, well, that's true, and nobody's trying to take away the specificity of Irish history any, any more than one would of Latvian history. But there's also a great deal to be gained from seeing it as part of a transnational context. And the fact that one of the one of those forces that the Great War unleashes or enormously reinforces, which it's impossible to put back in the bottle, is the feeling is the sense of nationality and the desire for nation states and more than the various sorts of home rule um, demands which have been there in both Ireland and Latvia, in fact, before 1914, that the war does something. Once you've mobilised on that scale, once you've lost people on that scale, once the demos, as I say, the people has been let out of the bottle, then, then nationality becomes enormously important. And this, it, of course, becomes the new dispensation sensation, the new order that the Allies are trying to create across Eastern Europe, um, and in a particularly complex way in the Baltic states, because they would prefer actually white Russia to... to, mm. to it's only when the Russian civil war has been lost by the whites that they can really endorse the, the emergent Baltic states. But at the same time, in Ireland, um, here you have, as a result of um, the, the Easter Rising in, in Dublin, um, and then the sweeping victory in nationalist Ireland of Sinn Féin in December 1918, which is calling for full Irish sovereignty, just in the same way mm. um, that, uh, that the Latvian nationalists are calling for full Latvian sovereignty at exactly the same moment, produces a war of independence in 1919, at exactly the same time that the war of independence is going on in Latvia, but with this difference, that whereas Latvians might look at the British with a kind of benign eye and see them as the siege of uh, in the Battle of Riga and so on, in November 1919, the, the, the British Navy, along with the French Navy, is helping um, and is endorsing um, an independent Latvia then in, in, 19, uh, in, in, in 1921. In the Irish case, the revolt is against the British. And because the British, um, the Irish, like the Latvians, take their case to the peace conference in Paris, uh, there's a Sinn Féin delegation having issued a, um, a declaration to all the nations of the world saying that Ireland has, is seizing its independence and demanding recognition, that's the key issue. But the British view is this is a matter for internal UK sovereignty. And so it leads to a war of independence, and that is fought outside the framework of the peace conference. That's the difference. So it's just, from the British point of view, a purely internal um, UK matter. And it leads to this very, very strange conclusion, which is that as a result of the Irish War of Independence, as you know, the country is partitioned. And in the northeast of the country, that remains, as it still is, part of the United Kingdom. But there is a very sizable Catholic and nationalist minority. The UK, Britain, has an unacknowledged minorities question just like the minorities' questions of the new independent states across Eastern Europe. But it's outside the framework of the League of Nations. And the Second World War does not resolve it in the terrible and radical way it does across so much of Eastern Europe. And so here we are, 100 years later, there is still a minority question in Northern Ireland. It's at the heart of the Brexit issue, and it goes back to the particular path which um, the Irish War of Independence took from 1919 to 1921. But as I say, the parallels are absolutely there with um, Latvia, with Lithuania, with Estonia and other countries too. We should see all of this as part of the greater war. Professor John Hall, thank you very much for joining me today. My and uh, I very much enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.